Well, friends, good evening. The Lord be with you. It is good to be together in worship this evening. This evening we come together for the purpose of praising and glorifying God, but also to observe the moment of Good Friday. Good Friday, of course, comes towards the end of the week that we call Holy, Holy Week, the most important, perhaps, and most beautiful week of the Christian year. For it is in Holy Week that we walk with Jesus from his final entrance into the city of Jerusalem, through the cross of Golgotha on Friday, and to the tomb of Holy Saturday. It's only in hindsight what Jesus did on Easter morning that we can truly look back and call this Good Friday. And in fact, if we do well with our worship this evening, good will hardly be the emotion that we leave with. As we come together this evening, we will pray prayers, we will sing a few songs, we will hear some of the, some of the songs of Holy Week. We will hear the scripture of God spoken to us, and we will consider the depth of the love that Jesus has for his world. And so as we prepare to come into worship, I want to invite you to take a moment to quiet your hearts and settle your minds. Please join me in just a moment of reflective listening for God's presence as we come into worship. Our opening words this evening come from The Rule and Exercise of Holy Living by Jeremy Taylor. This was written in 1650. All praise, honor, and glory be to thee, holy and eternal Jesus. I adore you, O blessed Redeemer, eternal God, the light of the Gentiles and the glory of Israel. For you have done and suffered For me, more than I could wish, more than I could think of, even all the lost and the dying sinner could possibly need. What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Blessed be your name, O holy Jesus, and blessed be that holy sorrow you endured when your disciples fled and you were left alone in the hands of cruel men who like evening wolves thirsted for a drink of your blood. And you were led to the house of Ananias. There they asked you ensnaring questions and you were slapped in the face by him whose ear you had but lately healed. From there you were dragged to the house of Caiaphas and there all night you endured spittings, mockings, scorned insult, blows, and intolerable cruelties, and all of this for man who was your enemy, the cause of all your sorrows. What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Blessed be your name, O holy Jesus, and blessed be your mercy, Who, when your servant Peter denied you and denied you again and swore he did not know you, you looked back at him and by that gracious and correcting look called him back to himself and to you. Blessed be your name, O holy Jesus, and blessed be your patience who were accused before the high priest and railed upon and examined to evil purposes and with designs of blood, who were declared guilty of death for speaking the necessary truth, who were sent to Pilate and found innocent and sent to Herod and still found innocent and were clothed clothed in white, both to declare your innocence and yet to ridicule you. 
and you were sent back to Pilate and examined again, nothing but innocence was ever found in you, and yet you willingly stood condemned for the guilt of humanity. What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Please join me in prayer. Gracious and loving God, tonight we come to you to worship you and to consider the depth of the love that you poured out in Jesus on our behalf. Lord, speak to us tonight. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening, everyone. I'm Micah Sanders, and join with me as I call us to confession. The psalmist declares, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications, because he inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. We gather as a community in need of a savior. We offer our honest confession in faith and trust in our covenant God. Now pray with me this prayer of confession together out loud. Eternal God, whose covenant with us is never broken, we confess that we have failed to fulfill your will for us. We betray our neighbors, desert our friends, 
and run in fear when we should be loyal. Though you have bound yourself to us, we have not bound ourselves to you. God, have mercy on us weak and willful people. Lead us once again to your table and unite us to Christ, who is the bread of life and the vine from which we grow in grace. To Christ be praise forever. Amen. Now take a few moments together in silent confession. Now hear this assurance of forgiveness. We have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the Jesus we remember tonight is the Savior of the world. In Christ we are forgiven, and through him God abides with even us. Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. And so now at this time, we want to offer up our Good Friday prayer on behalf of ourselves and on behalf of this world. Please join me in prayer. God of love, it is because of your immense love for us that you stooped to be our servant and willingly suffered to give us life. For that love, we give you thanks. Tonight, Lord, we also praise you for the way that love is evidenced in creation, in our community, in our church, in our lives, in the events of this holy week. 
God of love, you have given us a new command to love each other. Help us to show that love in our care of creation, to the nations of the world, to our nation and its leaders. In this community of Millwood, through the Church Universal, through Millwood Community Presbyterian Church and its ministry, and to people with particular needs. In all our thoughts and actions, may we be your servants and reflect your love. We pray this in the name of your servant, Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you forever. Amen. Hear now from Isaiah 53. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now, hear from Matthew 26. Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said. But he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway, where another servant girl saw him and said to the people there, This fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately, a rooster crowed. Our final reading from Scripture this evening comes from Matthew chapter 27, verses 45 through 54. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, Lemai Zabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he is calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge, and he filled it with wine vinegar. He put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rock split, and the tombs broke open. 
The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. And when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and they exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Despised, rejected, suffered, stricken, afflicted, pierced, and crushed. The picture painted by the prophet Isaiah played out, as we see later in the book of Matthew, as I just read. It's a picture of deep anguish. It's a scene of torture. The suffering servant that is described by Isaiah is one who has come to save, but only at great cost to himself. The the word that grabs hold of me tonight and throughout this holy week as we've walked with Jesus, the word that grabs me is reject. Jesus was rejected. Now, rejected is a word of judgment. Rejection only happens because an expectation that was held did not come to fruition. All of humanity, Isaiah says, rejected this suffering servant. And as the church has done throughout its history, we today look back at the prophecy of Isaiah and see that it was pointing in part to Jesus, the one who took our pain and bore our suffering, the one who was pierced for our transgressions and suffered for our iniquities, our transgressions, our iniquities. It makes it clear that if judgment is to be needed, it would be upon us whom that judgment should fall. After all, we humans were created with intention. We were created with purpose. We were made by a a God who is perfect in holiness who out of love created each and every single one of us. And we were each given a a vocation to be the, the, the bearer of God's image to this world. Last week, we we talked about the biblical pattern that we see established in Genesis, the pattern of creation, vocation, failure, and exile. There's there's no doubt, sadly, about the failure part. We each, in our honesty, recognize it. I'm, I'm not made, I'm not now whom I'm made to be. I'm not now who God intends for me to be. I'm not completely there, maybe in part, but only that. And and frankly, I hope that that's the case. Because again, in honesty, I know myself too well. I know that I'm broken, that I'm fallen, that I'm full of sin, pride, ego, self-arrogance, self-assurance, idolatry in more ways than I would care to admit. And he bore our iniquities. He bore our iniquities and in exchange gave us his righteousness. 
Martin Luther, the the father of the Reformation, calls this the wonderful exchange. He once wrote these words. He says, he said, this is the mystery which is rich in divine grace to sinners, wherein by a wonderful exchange, our sin is no longer ours, but Christ's. And the righteousness of Christ, not Christ's, but ours. He has emptied himself of his righteousness that he might clothe us with it and fill us with it. And he has taken our evil upon himself that he might deliver us from those evils. You know, it sounds kind of poetic the way Martin Luther puts it to words, and it is, but it's equally as terrible. We don't like to think about it. We don't like to think about the brokenness of humanity. We certainly don't like to think about the brokenness of ourselves, but we can't deny it. Certainly not in a modern day of quarantine, not in a time of global epidemic and worldwide economic fallout. It's there. It has to be dealt with. And so he was rejected by all of humanity. Well, in our story, when it comes to the disciples at least, We can probably wrap our heads around Judas, right? We can sort of of get our heads around why Judas might reject Jesus. Judas was kind of shaky from the get-go. There's really no winning moments for Judas in our scriptures. He betrayed the Lord. He got caught. He couldn't live with himself. He sort of fits into our sense of justice. But the passage that Micah read regarding Peter, that's a different story. So many of us can kind of identify with Peter. Peter had his faults, absolutely, but those faults usually came out of over-enthusiasm. He made mistakes, but they were honest mistakes. But there was never any doubt throughout the stories that Peter was on Jesus' side. Peter always had the back of Jesus. Peter even got to walk on water. He was there for the high moments. He walked with Jesus up onto the mountains during the transfiguration. He was there at the, at the Sermon on the Mount. He was witness to the feeding of the 5,000. Peter had seen it all. I mean, what on earth would it take for Peter to reject Jesus. Apparently, all it took was the accusation of a servant girl and a whole lot of fear. He was rejected by all of humanity, even those who were closest to him, even us. On Sunday, the week before, the crowd cheered him. On Friday, they yell, crucify. On Thursday, Peter will swear that he'll never fall away. And just a few hours later, he did. And so, Jesus was crucified He was hung on a cross between two criminals, one somewhat repentant, one obstinate. And with his death came the great darkness. It was out of the darkness that light had come, the light of life, St. John will call it. But now that darkness once again, has overcome the light. 
In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.